Hi, welcome back to Advanced Algorithms. We talked a bit last time about hashing and while scrolling over pages of computations, the last thing that we considered, um, so I'm, well, to trace back one step further, I promised that we will look at three different applications of, random, of randomization and randomness with respect to hashing, the first one was uh, in the analysis. If we make the uniform hashing assumption, then what we obtain is the so-called balls into bins model where for, for every of these n balls, we draw one of the m bins uniformly at random and independent of all the other, um, of the other balls. And if you then count the number of balls in a certain bin, you get uh, quantities that are equally distributed, but they're not independent because they have to sum to n, uh, but they have a sharp concentration around their expectation. But if you have n and m the same, then this sharp concentration is not so um, uh, much retained anymore because it's only true for large n. But if m is also large now, uh, then the concentration is not so, it's not so uh, strong anymore. So that indeed the largest, the most loaded bin has this strange number. So we only proved an upper bound, uh, but you can actually make this a theta. So you can also show that there is usually one, uh, one bin that has so many balls. I I said last time that this is a negative and a positive result. And if you look at the worst case, then hashing is maybe not as good as it seems because you might, uh, you always almost have this logarithmic behavior of a search tree, but it's only for the worst bin of all. And usually only a few bins will have so many balls. So for the average bin or the average ball in the average bin, uh, the search cost is still pretty good. And in fact, we will see today that the, the performance in this balls into bin model is actually very uh, idealistic and optimistic and not really achievable in, in practical situations because it would require two good hash functions. So, hmm. oops. I would like to have my default pen back. So the balls into bins model. is optimistic. As I mentioned last time, it's essentially the best situation you could hope for. because it assumes that uh, these random variables are mutually independent. Where bj is the bin of the jth ball. So you can think of that this is just the index, so a number in one up to m and then these should all be uh, totally independent in this in this sense that we've introduced uh, a few lectures back um, this is to be contrasted with uh, more restricted forms of independence and as we will see these play a role today so there's several reasons why this is usually not possible to attain in practice and one reason is the space consumption. If we would like to have such a fully random hash function, so a function, and we can even restrict our attention here to a fixed set, uh, so a set, a set of, of fixed size. And we map that to the, the bin indices, 
So even if we don't consider the uh, dynamic case where you, we insert and delete, where we have a fixed size given, uh, then there's m to the n different such hash functions. And that means we need at least the, the dual logarithm of that number uh, of bits to store to at least know which of all these hash functions we have. So this is uh, a lower bound. It could actually be, um, well, we don't only want to store the hash function, we also want to compute it and compute it efficiently. Otherwise, the whole hash table is not really usable. So usually we will not even be able to use such a succinct representation. But this is already something that's at least linear in the set of this, in the size of this set that we, that we want to store. So we need the same space to store the hash function as we need for the hash table. That's not very, um, not very efficient. Uh, n is the size of, is the number of different balls that I want to store. Uh, well, in principle, you can restrict it here to the balls that you actually consider. If you ignore that there's more. In the dynamic setting, you certainly had, you actually have to, to take the whole universe. And then it's even worse, yeah. So you, you might argue that you don't have to decide you don't have to distinguish functions that only differ in balls that you never see. This is uh, usually we don't uh, explicitly talk about the universe. Uh, well, in any case, that's too expensive. So if that is too expensive, but we would still like to have a, a defense against the worst case. So some kind of randomness uh, should be in the process. Otherwise, you have the situation that there's always a certain sequence of inputs where you have all hash to the same bin in the, in the absolute worst case. And I guess. Uh, you've seen this idea before, namely universal hashing. So uniform hashing was the assumption that we talked about up to now, the balls and bins model. Now universal hashing, uh, the name is not extremely specific and I'm not very fond of this name because it doesn't uh, tell you so much what it's like. Uh, this below is, is uh, better, but it's not exactly the one that's used in practice. So universal hashing is a way to have a limited amount of randomness and still some reasonable guarantees. And it's often treated in an elementary algorithms course, so we will not spend very much time with the, with the ideas here. So the, the setting is we have a set of hash functions that all map our universe to the range that we would like to use for the bins. And the idea is that we choose one of these hash functions uniformly at random. Uh, so I, I can even at this point say if H was just the set of all functions, then all of the following statements are true, but this is what we would not like to do because it's too expensive to sample from this large uh, set of functions. So we would like to have much more restricted classes of functions. That's the idea. And then such a set is called universal. If for a random function, uh, the probability of two different elements to hash to the same value is as it would be for a completely random function. And that's the essence. So this will usually be uh, equal. It can't be smaller for all elements. 
that would be kind of a contradiction to a pigeonhole principle. Uh, but it's, it's convenient to write the lesser equal. So if whenever you have two different ones, then their hash value collides with, the prob with this fixed probability one over m. This is how a random function would behave. But this does not state anything about the probability that, for example, some x1 has the same value as x2 or has the same value as x3 or some other connection. The point is that uh, these events here have a certain interdependence via this x1. And this only ever talks about pairs of elements from the universe. That's what makes it easier to apply or to find such uh, sets of functions. But that will also weaken the guarantees that we can prove. There's a slightly stricter version um, that's only different in, in a few details. Um, and it says that now you not only fix the two elements from the universe, but also you fix two addresses or two bin indices. And then this, this joint event that they both have this specific value is again exactly the probability that you would have if you choose a completely random function. So this is a, s a slightly stronger statement than this um, because this also quantifies over all different indices. Whereas well it's, it's not even easy to construct cases where this is not fulfilled, but this is. Um, one thing is that strongly universal always implies universal. I will just list a few examples of such universal hash functions. And I guess the first one, if you have seen one, then this is probably the one. We have functions with two parameters, a, b. And then they map a value. So now assuming that uh, the universe is actually just an, an integer range. So. Uh, did we have a num? I think we didn't have. Uh, let's call it capital N, maybe. Oh, uh, but capital number letters. Let's let's write it like this. So I'm implicitly assuming that U is just a set of integers or an integer interval, which in the general case um, is not necessary. Let me take some a fine or linear function, use that, compute modulo p for some prime p. And you should think about p to be just uh, fixed, some prime larger than m. And then the first set of functions that we look at is all the HABs, where A is between 1 and P minus 1. Well, let's write, let's write it like this, an open integer interval. And for B, we allow 0. then this is a universal class. And it's the, the canonical example that you might have seen before. The important thing here is that p is a prime, which means that the, the modulo ring is, is a field. And that's, again, uh, some algebra with, these, um, with this modulo operations, but we're not uh, we're not proving this statement. It's something that you 
probably seen before. If you modify this class a very tiny bit, then you actually get a strongly universal class. Uh, which interestingly contains the zero function that just assigns all to the bin zero uh, if, if a is zero and b is also which is kind of uh, a very bad hash function but since you only choose it with a certain probability uh, this still fulfills this this property which is kind of nice <laughs> or, or maybe not I mean the interesting thing is that if you exclude the zero here, then you kind of lose this property. This class is also, if you look at it from another perspective, um, I didn't comment on this uh, alternative name for strongly universal. It's also called pairwise independent. So the, the set of hash function is called pairwise independent. And the, the reason is that if you consider h of x1 and h of x2 as a random variable, because h is random, then these events, if you consider this for all elements in the universe, they are pairwise independent, which is because that's exactly the, um, the definition of pairwise independence, if you make this an equal. Uh, but they are not mutually independent, as we had in th with the uniform hashing assumption. And you can generalize this notion to k-wise independent, not just two-wise or pairwise, but more. And then you can use functions of the same kind and actually this here is just a polynomial of degree one, right? And if you go to higher degree polynomials, you get strongly universal classes for higher degree, or you get uh, k-wise independent hash functions. That's a, a construction that's, um, that's often used in some theoretical works. The point is that these are not extremely efficient to evaluate. You always have to take modulo with respect to some large prime, which is a comparatively expensive operation. Uh, therefore, I would just like to list another class of functions that has much better uh, qualities when it comes to evaluating it because it only uses modulo and diff with powers of two. So this is for the special case that we actually have ranges like this. So that should be open again. In theory, that's a, a restriction, but in practice it's not. Usually we have the universe is just some numbers and they are represented by a certain number of bits. And for the range, it's also a good choice to have powers of two because usually for hashing in practice, you do this doubling trick. If the hash table becomes too full, you just double its size and rehash everything. And when it becomes too empty, you shrink it. And thereby, you usually keep the size of the hash table as a power of two. Uh, which for these modulo versions is actually one of the not so great choices because it means you definitely have to use an additional uh, prime number and that even should grow with the table size so you have to mess with keeping a list of uh, primes and this alternative version of hash functions can avoid that And you can take the class where a is uh, an odd number in the range here. And then this is also universal. The, 
proof is again uh, a bit uh, of an exercise in algebra, so I will I will skip that. Uh, this class of hash function is interesting from another point of view because it it was invented in the middle of some paper dealing with a very different problem, and it doesn't have anything like super cool new hash uh, universal hash function class in the title. It's a, a technical lemma and a side note actually in in the paper, uh, but it could be a a major contribution for practical hashing because the these operations mod and diff are extremely efficient on binary computers so that's for for the universal universal hash functions um, needless to say that in practice if you think of Java or so where you implement your own hash functions it's not uh, very common to use any kind of randomization at all. Uh, but I've read that at least for web servers, people use uh, salted hashes also for hash tables. So the term comes from cryptography and storing passwords, uh, but they also try to do that just for ordinary hash tables to avoid complexity attacks. Actually, Rust does that by default. If you try to implement hashing. What was it? Rust language. That the Rust point. language. You have no choice. Okay. Having they always use salted hashes. Yeah, it's, it's a reasonable choice. And universal hashing is essentially what's behind that. Because what you choose randomly here is just two numbers, or maybe even one number. Now the question is, um, <coughs> what guarantees can we still get if we only have these pairwise independent or universal hash functions? And to discuss that a bit, let's define indicator random variables. And well, I'll just use items from the universe and balls kind of synonymously. Uh, so we have two elements from the universe. And if they hash to the same bin, then this indicator is 1 and 0 otherwise. Then a quantity of interest is just to sum up all of these. Because that's the total number of collisions. This is a random thing because the hash function is random. And in this case, we again assume that there's a fixed set of uh, integers or numbers that, or elements in general that we would like to store in our hash table. But we don't know this set up front. So it's still the, the dynamic setting that you're just presented. Here are the n items, now store them, please. Uh, we will not discuss in detail how to do incremental inserts and deletes. Uh, but that doesn't make um, so much of a difference, except for these doubling uh, issues. I mean, whenever you fix a hash table of a certain size and people keep on inserting, you have to do something if it's too full. But there's no way uh, a clever hash function will help you in that. You always have to do some kind of uh, rehashing and doubling. Uh, but if you do it cleverly, it only affects the amortized performance. And that's, well, that's out of the discussion. And to avoid that discussion, I'll just assume we have n elements given that we store in the hash table, but we don't know which they are, so we can't just tailor our hash function to these elements. But instead, we choose the hash function at random from some universal class. And then we can count what the number of collisions uh, are. Now, just to note that one more time, the probability that any of these is 1 is bounded by 1 over m. That was just by the fact that we are using a universal hash function. So And 
to say that again, choosing such a function for these examples was nothing more than choosing these parameters, so choosing one or two random numbers. That's certainly practical. So this is true, uh, but for any two such indicators that have some value in common, these are not necessarily independent. Because that's just not guaranteed by the, by the choice of the hash functions. But what we always can do is use the linearity of expectation. That's true even for dependent random variables. And by the probability that we just computed, or well, that we just noted that is bounded like this by the um, universal universality guarantee, we have that this is 1 over m. And the number of terms here is n choose 2, because it's all subsets of indices. So i must be less than j. <coughs> And it will be convenient to bound it like this. So you know that this is n times n minus 1 half. So it's uh, less than n squared half. This is something we will have to uh, keep in mind. That pops up uh, several times in the, in the following. So the expected number of, of these collisions is quadratic in the number of inserted elements, but we divide by the number of bins. Uh, so there's some hope that if we make m large enough, we won't have many collisions. Uh, but with m linear in n, the number of collisions that we expect is also linear. That does not necessarily mean that there's a linear number of balls in a single bin, because these collisions are summed over all bins. And in fact, um, if we call y the number of balls in the fullest bin. So you remember from the balls in bins models, when we have um, mutual independence of all the of all the bins, then this balls into bins. There we had that y is theta of log n over log log n if n and m are the same. And this was with high probability. So let's see what we can get with only the pairwise independence. If we have y balls in, in a single bin, that means that this bin at least contributes y choose too many collisions. Because the collisions were defined for pairs of balls, like inversions for permutations. So if you have a certain number of balls in a single bin, then all pairs of size 2 of these balls uh, contribute one collision. Okay. So the total number of collision that we see with this hash function must be at least this. And now we can bound the probability for this event. The probability that y is greater or equal n times 2 over m and the square root of this thing. Why is that? Because that means Um, if we take x, then we essentially have to square both sides. And because the bounds are in the, in the right direction, 
this is a weaker requirement, so that has a larger probability. But this is the probability that, um, so the two here, in case you wonder, is because this is, again, not just squaring, but also dividing by two. Right? So again, this is. Uh, this and that's nothing else than asking whether x is larger than twice its expectation right and now comes Markov's inequality which says that this is uh, this probability is at most one half so the guarantee that we get is a good a good deal weaker if we consider the same case as before, where the number of bins is the same as the number of balls, then y is less than 2 square root n, square root 2n, at least in half the cases. is a, a bit more than log n over log log n. Um, and it's not even with high probability, it's only with at least one half. So you would have to, to go higher if you want to increase the probability here. And I think it's, uh, it's not even easy to show any kind of high probability bounds with any reasonable bound here simply because we don't have this mutual independence, we can't use any kind of Chernoff bounds. So it will be, will be tough to improve that. Uh, I didn't find an easy way to say, to, to show that this is also what you will typically have. So uh, to show an, a corresponding lower bound. So what we've shown is even if we have only the pairwise independent or universal hash functions and not the fully independent or fully random ones, uh, we can still bound the fullest bin by square root n roughly. But maybe it's actually much better and I can just not prove it. Uh, so it would be nice to have a lower bound that shows y is also of this order with a certain probability, but I uh, didn't find something like this. So this is the best guarantee that, that I can offer you for universal hashing. Uh, but it's at least better than nothing. Uh, if you just use the deterministic hash functions, you don't get any guarantee other than, well, uh, never more than all balls in one bin, which is no guarantee. So square root is still better than that. And from a practical point of view, it's usually sufficient And this has uh, two reasons. One thing is that it still uh, gives you defense against worst cases in that there's a somewhat limited but still a certain amount of randomness um, involved. The second thing why it's often useful in practice is that uh, typical inputs have uh, themselves some kind of randomness. And you can, Im in well, you can formulate the, a rigorous model for that concerning some kind of entropy of the input. And then you can show that even for the, for the weak randomness with universal hashing, you still get much better bounds like this if you assume a bit uh, about the input distribution. Um, but that's uh, nothing that we will do in this course. I'll come to a, a third application of randomness in hashing, and that's actually very, very closely related to what we've just seen, uh, but for a very different application, and that's perfect hashing. 
So this is, it's a different goal of randomization that we have here. We use random sampling to find some uh, specific structure that has good properties. And we will use rejection sampling to find one such. And to do so in, in a reasonable amount of time, we have to show that the probability to find a good structure is, is not too small. So what's perfect hashing? The setting is, um, is also called static hashing. You have a certain subset of the universe that is fixed. You're just given this set and then you can start constructing your hash functions. And you should um, construct the data structure that has guaranteed constant time for search or access. Um, but to make the task a bit easier, no ins insertions or deletions are allowed. So the applications are a bit more limited, but still in, in many cases, the set that you're interested in might be fixed. So I don't know, one made up example is a huge list just of, uh, well, we think of a dictionary and, an, and a spell checker that would like to see if, if a certain word is contained there. You would probably not use hashing for strings because you can can exploit the structure of strings and use some try or so. But you could use hashing if all the strings are of a fixed length. And then you might be interested in building some structure once and for <coughs> all, but it should, well, it should be O of one access time. And it should be, if we have N keys, it should have O of N space. Without that requirement, it's actually simple because we can just uh, use any class of universal hash functions. And if we choose age at random, So if we are willing to use a quadratic number of bins, right? Then the probability that the number of collisions, the same axis before, is greater or equal than one. So to have any collisions at all, uh, so using this, that's the bound that we had before, which turned out to be twice the expectation. So that probability was at most one half. So if we're willing to spend a quadratic number of bins or a quadratic space, then we can just sample a few uh, functions from a universal family and after well in expectation two tries we find such function that has no collisions because of course this means um, no collisions is the probability that x is zero since that's an integer random variable this has probability at least one half. So that's fine. Uh, but of course, we wouldn't like to have quadratic space. Now the question is, can we improve upon that? And the answer is 
Well, as long as we're fixing a single universal hash function, we will not be able to, to improve this number of, of collisions. Uh, but we can use a trick. And the idea is to use two layers of hash functions. We use the first hash function to assign balls to n bins. And that will have a certain number of collisions, which is unavoidable. But then each bin is split a, sec a second time. Where we have n more hash functions. And then in a way, well, many more bins, in a way so that the number of bins here is quadratic in the number of elements in that first bin. So that we will have a few collisions here with a good probability. And the point is that it, by this two layering approach, we will be able to show that our linear space suffices. So a linear number of bins in total suffices to, to get that. That's a very simple and very nice trick. Uh, but if you first look at this, it seems like there's no way to get that. Why should we ever get rid of this quadratic space? Uh, but you can do it like this. So to have a bit of notation, say so these are the num this, uh, number of balls in this first level of bins. So in the H1 bins. <coughs> that means uh, the space that we need, okay, I should maybe write down uh, here. So there's Y1 balls in this and then you use y1 squared bins and the same here yj yj bins here so the space requirement in the end is n for these bins okay uh, just for the bins um, we also have to store the hash functions uh, but since they're coming from one of these good old uh, universal classes, we can store each of these hash functions each, uh, in well one word or we need one number to represent each of these hash functions. And we have a linear number of hash functions to store. So that's uh, linear, but it's not a linear number of bits. It's a linear number of numbers. Well, uh, the bins also will not be just bits usually. So uh, space is in a, in a wake sense. Here we count only the number of bins, which is the interesting part of the, of the analysis. So we, see we need the uh, large bins up here. And then we need the sum of the yj squared bins on the second level. So if we don't do anything clever, this could be huge uh, because these yj's can be up to n. <coughs> and the first observation is that these h2j can be chosen without collisions. by rejection sampling. Because by exactly the result that we just had, if we are willing to pay a quadratic number of bins, there's the probability one half that you are successful. So we just continue drawing on an expectation we will have just two tries. And also there's, a, there's also a kind of a good tail bound for geometric distributions. So this is, this is definitely efficient. 
So we will not have any collisions on second level. And the second idea is we also have to choose H1 cleverly so that the Y's don't get too large. So we do again some rejection sampling. until we find one where the, the total number of collisions that this H1 produces um, is at most n. Now we can do that because um, well for H1 we set the number of bins to n, right? So that means again that this reduces <coughs> to n and that was by the same arguments as all the time. I think it was the third time that we used the same trick. Uh, so same as here. So we also have to choose only uh, two times on expectation until we find an H1 that has in total a linear number of collisions. So these collisions were defined pairwise, if you remember. And in fact, this, this already suffices for what, we, for what we show because We have uh, yj balls in, in bin j on the first level. Then this bin contributes yj choose two uh, collisions to x. So if we sum up all these, then the total number of collisions can be at most n. And that gives us a bound on this, which is not so far away from squared. And that's the last step that we, that we need. Uh, well, maybe not x, let's just call it, uh, well, L choose two is this, so which is L squared half um, minus L half. So what we have in our space bound is the squares. So you can upper bound this by two times L choose two plus L. In fact, it's equal, so not even an upper bound. So the space requirement was the N for the first level bins, the YJ squared for the second level bins and now here we use this, this equality. And then uh, as we've just seen, we choose our age exactly so that this is at most n. And this is always larger than this, so this is always at most n. So in total, we have at most 4n bins that we have to store. So that way, we found a linear space 
data structure that suffice, that fulfills all the requirements that we have. So and the access time is, is not only constant, it's really very cheap because we evaluate two hash functions. The first one gives us which hash function to evaluate and in which table to look up. And the second is we evaluate the second hash function and access one array. That's uh, cheap enough. And in practice, these are all the hash functions are just characterized by a number or two. So what you would have in, in term, in, instead of these bins here, you would store the parameters for the secondary hash functions there in a table. So it's, it's a very efficient uh, data structure. <coughs> uh, just as a remark, uh, you can make this even in the dynamic setting so that in amortized sense, you still have a constant time insert and delete and retain the worst case O of one for searches. So it's O of one amortized expected time then for insert and delete. And the trick is that you have to rebuild the small bins, the secondary level bins, if they become too full. And occasionally you also have to rebuild the whole thing if there were too many inserts and you can then juggle around with the numbers so that you do the, the large and costly rebuilds only after many inserts have been done. And so it's, uh, I'm not saying that this is easy, but there's a, there's a nice paper that describes this. I just wanted to mention it. Um, no further details. So that's the, the three uses of randomization in hashing that I wanted to present. Uh, and I think this is, um, it's, a, it's a nice piece of theory and it shows that hashing without randomization is um, not half as useful as it is with. I would also like to mention that there's, uh, the general classes of universal hash functions don't give you better guarantees than what we've discussed, but for some specific classes of universal hash function, you can show uh, more, s more um, well, stricter guarantees on, for example, the most loaded bin or so. So it's not that these are impractical. It's just uh, in the very general case, you can show better bounds. Okay, now uh, we come to an entirely different topic from points of view of applications. We're still concerned with random sampling in a certain sense, but it's used for a different purpose here. And in particular, we will look at local searches, uh, which is something that did not come up yet. Uh, we've at, se at several points in time we used some algorithm that says now choose a random thing from this set and then hopefully it has certain guarantees. We did that for primality tests, we did that for hash functions, um, but we didn't um, break up things and modify them locally just a bit. Uh, but there's a nice algorithm for satisfiability that's based on that. And we will discuss one for two set today and the general one will follow. Uh, the point is that two set is actually an easy problem. You know that it's, it's in P. I think you can even solve it in linear time. Uh, yeah, maybe that's a, a good exercise. I think, I think about it. Uh, it's, it's an easy problem, but even though it's easy, the deterministic linear time algorithms are not completely trivial. They build on a few other uh, algorithms which are 
which have good properties but are not, not trivial. But we can give a very simple randomized algorithm that's not so bad. The algorithm works like, follow, like, like this. We once at the beginning choose a random assignment, just uniformly from all possible ones. And then usually this will not directly satisfy the formula. So we repeat for, well, quite a number of times, uh, a local adjustment step. If the formula is not yet satisfied, there's one clause at least that's not satisfied, okay? And we just choose one of these arbitrarily. So this is not random, or not it doesn't have to be uniformly at random or some, something like that. We just choose any of the clauses. And in fact, the same is actually true for this one. Uh, you could just start with the all zero assignment. Uh, I think this guarantee that we're proving holds for any fixed assignment. You don't even have to do this. So this is not necessary. Now this will be different for the three set algorithm that we are actually uh, discussing because that's an interesting example of a, a randomized algorithm. Uh, but here it's not necessary. Here it's not necessary. Now here comes in randomness. For every such clause that's not fulfilled, we pick one of the uh, literals and swap the assignment at this point. And the idea is if this clause is not fulfilled, at least one of the literals must be, um, well, all literals must be false. So if you swap any one, you make at least that clause true. And that should bring you intuitively closer to a satisfying assignment. Of course, life is not as easy. You could invalidate other clauses by that, for sure. Right? But uh, this kind of local step is, uh, so seems sensible from the perspective of just this single clause. Right? Uh, it doesn't appear, it does, it's not obvious why you should be here very careful and just pick one with equal probability. That's what we will um, discuss in a second. So we pick one of these literals, negate that, negate the variable that's in this literal and get a new assignment and then you just repeat that a certain number of times. Uh, is the algorithm clear for, for that part? And then the statement is that this algorithm, if it's given an unsatisfiable formula, then it will never return the wrong result and I mean, that's obvious from the algorithm. It tries to guess an assignment, and if there is none, it can't guess one. The interesting part is the second. If it's given a formula that is satisfiable, then we have a, a good probability guarantee. This is actually very close to one if you pass a, a reasonably large parameter certainty here. So that's supposed to be some integer, say 10, right? Then you will have uh, a one one in a thousand chance that you fail. So let's see uh, how we can, can prove this second part. So just to say that again, that's trivial from the code. For the second part, um, we assume that this formula is satisfiable. So there is some assignment A star, alpha star, that satisfies the formula. In general, there can be more, but we will just 
assume that there is one and um, obtain upper bounds for whatever follows. Now in the course of the algorithm, we compute a sequence of assignments. And let just alpha j be the assignment in step j. And now we consider the Hamming distance between the assignment that we look at in a certain step and the one satisfying assignment that we're guaranteed that it exists. Okay. Now, if for some i we have a value of uh, zero, Uh, I guess it will be more convenient to take it the other way around. So let's take k minus the difference. So it's the number of matching matching variables. So that means when all match, then the algorithm terminates and announces the formula as satisfiable, which is, which is the correct answer. And if that is not yet the case, the next value with the next assignment can only differ by one. It can go one up or one down. We always make one change, so it also can't stay the same. minus one or plus one um, with the single exact uh, exception that if if we already had a value of zero then there's no way to go down anymore The interesting statement is what's the probability to go up or down? So if we currently are at J matches, then I claim the probability to attain one more match is at least one half. And the reason is The literal that we consider, or the well, the clause that we consider consists of these two literals, and it's satisfied with L star with alpha star because it's a satisfying assignment, uh, but it was not satisfied with our assignment. So at least one of the two must differ, and if we guess the right one, we make that ch uh, change in the right direction. All we have to show is that one of the two differs and well if both were the same then this clause would have to be satisfied because alpha star is a satisfying assignment well then the only other event that's possible is to go down that's then the counter probability and that describes um, a certain stochastic process that has the property that its next step uh, only depends on the on the previous state, and this is called a Markov chain. Uh, it is not 
Well, in that case, it's not strictly a Markov chain because we don't know the actual values of these probabilities. And in fact, if you think about the formulas, usually uh, it will not only depend on the number of matches, but also on which variables, how many choices you have to make the next uh, step in the right direction. Uh, but we can bound the number of steps that we take if we take a pessimistic version of this process. We know that there's always at least one half probability to go up. Let's pessimistically assume it's exactly one half and the same for do going down. Then the number of steps until we reach such uh, a terminating state, if we just keep going, if we don't abort the algorithm, if we just keep going, then the expected number of steps in the red process is at, mo is at least the, one, the number in the original process. until one of these x i is k by a Markov chain. So we don't need any formal properties of Markov chains, so I skip any formal definitions. Um, just briefly to say that um, a sequence of random variables so that the probability for the next one to attain a certain value only depends on the last, the value of the last of these variables in the sequence. That's a Markov chain. So the idea is that you don't have to remember the states of all x1, x2, x, and so on up to xj. Only xj itself depends, uh, determines what the probability for the next step is. And what this means for the computer scientist is that we're dealing with um, a finite state machine. So let's draw the possible states for our axis. We can have no, miss, no matches. We can have one or two and three and so on. Up to k minus one and then k. Now this state is, is accepting the sink and whenever whenever you uh, set foot in this state the process dies and terminates well dies sounds negative it's actually a good thing right then we were successful now from state zero we had the po the probability one to go up because there was just nothing else that could happen and from these others we had a certain probability to go up and we just set that to be one half in each case. Right, oh sorry, this is, this is not really present. This is accepting, so it doesn't have any outgoing arcs. And this is how we often represent Markov chains by such an automaton. And the Markov property that I just sketched is, if I am in this state, then whatever comes next only determines on that state and its outgoing arcs. And the whole history, what path I took through this graph uh, is irrelevant. And that makes um, a lot of uh, properties easier to determine for such a process than in the general case. Uh, but we will not discuss that in any more detail. Uh, what we need here is for a state i, the expected number of steps until we fall in this sink. So for one thing, we can always go on for, in for forever uh, walking in circles in this graph, but there's always a positive probability to go to the sink. So that means we will always have an, a, a finite expected number of steps until we fall in the sink but it's maybe not clear what this number is. <coughs> uh, 
And it, it turns out that we can discuss this whole uh, solution, how we compute these expected numbers in a much more general setting. And just because it doesn't add any clutter, I'll do that. In the general case, uh, we could say that there's different probabilities. We always have um, a pi probability to go up and a qi, which is 1 minus pi, to go down. Um, and we could even, we can even say that we don't count only steps, we count some other costs and the costs depend on the state that we are in. If you think about that this might be uh, some kind of computation, then it could be that the states have different costs. In our application, it will actually not be the case, uh, but for the sake of generality and as long as it doesn't cause any trouble let's keep the most general setting that we can, can that we can deal um, then for this yi we can um, make a few more statements yk is certainly zero because we already reached the sink y0, okay, here I'll just define that uh, c0 is 1, okay. Could have made that also more general, but uh, for some reason I didn't, so I'll, I will not change that now on the fly. Now for the interesting cases in between, we always have to add the costs for visiting this current state. Then we have a certain probability to go up and then the expected number to reach the sink are the same uh, as if I started there with the probability that I go there actually. It's like uh, splitting off the first step of this remaining path to the sink. I'm currently at the node I then the first step either has to go up or down, there's no other possibilities, so I just average over two, over these two, and then from there take the expected value of the number of steps that are need from there. So that's essentially just exploiting linearity. to k minus 1. Well, these are, uh, this is a nice set of recurrences, actually. And we could try to solve them by the uh, well-tested method that we've seen before. But at least in my artificially made up general setting where these probabilities depend on the state, it's for sure not one of these constant coefficient recurrences that we've seen before. So it's not directly uh, solvable by generating functions. Um, why do we have to use pi and not just one? Uh, the question was why do we use the ci's just because we can at this point. So the idea is uh, I replace this number of steps by the expected cost which just means whenever I enter one of these states, I incur the cost ci. And well, as, as a mistake, I forgot to generalize the cost of the first step of the first state. Well, um, I don't think it has any consequences. So that's the, the costs here. We will later s uh, set the C's to 1 again. Uh, but it doesn't add any clutter at this point, so I'll just keep it. Yeah? Is it confusing because first you want to define uh, Y, Z, Y, I as expected number of steps, so you use K, and then you say Y, I is C, 
Yeah, usually this will be one. In the application for the analyzing this two side algorithm, it's one. But in general, you could require that you have to walk in circles for CI times here. Uh, it's just for the sake of mathematical generality. I don't have any justification other than that. My point is, you can make this recurrence a bit more interesting, which then excludes the method that we've already seen. But there's still an easy trick how, to s how we can solve it. And the point is that these pi and qi must sum to 1. So what we can do is um, move a bit of, oh, we can simply split up this into Um, pi and qi parts of y and then by rearranging so we subtract this bring it to the other side then we have pi yi plus one minus yi and everything else I just put to the other side so there's a qi yi sitting there now I subtract this And I also subtract the C. And now this already looks like it would like to be divided by PI. Well, let's directly write it. Let's say this is some factor AI. And this is some BI where AI actually is QI divided by PI and BI is minus CI divided by PI. Okay. And now this, um, this equation here is nothing but a rewritten form of this one, but it actually expresses the recurrence of the differences. And well, if you think about this as kind of some kind of functional equation, then this would be kind of a differential equation, which involves the derivatives. And so we can make a, a nice substitution. I'm just using the dot on top of y as an identifier. It's, it doesn't have any semantic, but it's not uh, without purpose that it looks a bit like the way physicists write derivatives with respect to time because it's essentially like that just in a discrete sense and then we have a, a nice recurrence for these which is actually about the nicest kind of recurrence you can have because it's directly telescoping uh, we should also check the boundaries so you can go with this up to the first y1 minus y0 and here it's particularly nice the difference between these two is just minus one so let me add it might be minus uh, z0 in the general case that i forgot to m to do but that means uh, here we can essentially just unfold the recurrence now it's um, a bit of a, a tedious exercise to actually do it. But if you do that, if you insert and insert and insert, you know you notice that there's a, se a sequence of products of these a's in front of the final value. And if you do that, uh, what you find is that you have this prefactor and then the y is zero which is minus one as we've just seen well and each time um, you insert here you get an a summand of b which also has a certain number of a's up front and if you work it out it's 
the result is like this. So this is really like uh, inserting, guessing a pattern, and proving by induction that this is the general form. I'll skip that boring part. And here you just see that you can keep these general A's and B's that depend on the indices. For really computing something, uh, in the end, we will profit from the fact that these are actually all the same. So we found an explicit representation for the, the differences of the y's. And now how do you get the function if you have the derivative? You integrate. How do you get the actual sequence if you have the, the differences? You sum. And if we sum from 0 up to some value, And this is a telescoping uh, sum, because this is always yl plus 1 minus yl. So what remains is yi minus y0. And we can in particularly, we can particularly use, use that for yk. So bring that to the other side. yk is this plus the sum. And in principle, we can just insert what we know about the, the y dots in this sum. Then we have an explicit representation. And this yk was 0, because yk means we're already in the absorbing <laughs> state. Uh, and then we can. It might have been more elegant to directly write it in that form. So y0 is just minus this here. OK. So what I just wanted to show is that you can solve this, the expected number from any state, but also in particular from the zero state, which will have the highest number because it's the farthest away. You can explicitly compute this expected cost uh, until you reach the sink in a pretty general setting. Now, admittedly, we don't actually need that. Um, in our case, the A's are all the same. And actually, if you re remember, um, the a's were given by these, the probability to go down divided by the probability to go up. In our Markov chain, these were both one half. So uh, that's a particularly nice case for a is one. And the b i's, they are here also all the same. That was minus c i divided by p i. So this was one, as you already noticed. And this is 1 half, so it's minus 2. And if we insert these in the general form here, you notice that all these products simplify a good bit, right? Because we're just taking powers of, of 1. Um, Uh, what you find in the end, or well maybe we can can do a few steps in between. If you simply insert into here, then this whole product just uh, goes away. And this is a minus 1. In this term, again, this product is 1. And the b is minus 2. So we have minus 2 and the sum. Well, then we sum up once. So uh, what we have is exactly minus 2i minus 1. And 
And then it's also not so hard. Let's take the general form. Um, Uh, then we would have to sum differently. Okay, we'll only compute y0 here. Sum up all these. The minus goes away. Um, I think this i should have been a k. Because we use this formula here with k. I'm sorry. Now the, the yl dot is just this with a minus, so 2l plus 1. Well, and if I'm not mistaken, then this is just k squared. Um, that's uh, something you might remember, that if you sum up the odd integers, you always get a square. Because you, that's 1, 3, five you always get a square okay so what does this tell us uh, it says no matter where we start in the worst case we need k squared steps in expectation until we fall into the absorbing state so the expected number of iterations of the loop is k squared. We were in the case that the formula is satisfiable, so there is an, an absorbing state and we can actually reach it. Now the expected number is, is not what we're actually interested in. So now comes the default trick, right? that the number of iterations is larger than, well, we had this certainty times two to the k squared. And that's by Markov Okay, so it's the expectation divided by this, but then the expectation is k squared, so that cancels. Now I would like to have this in the power. Um, and I think I made a mistake in the algorithm. The, the idea is that you run two k squared steps from any point where you start, and then you have the probability to reach the absorbing state or not. And then you conceptually do this complete step certainty times so that you have certainty independent repetitions of this experiment. Uh, I think it would have been nicer to write that as an outer loop. But in fact, since this is a Markov chain, it doesn't make a difference if you sample a new assignment and start walking from there or if you just keep on walking in the same, in the same chain. It just means that uh, this is not the way to go for the analysis. So this is correct, but it's not proving what I'm, pro what I'm stating. Any sequence of 2k squared um, iterations of the loop has probability one half to fall in the absorbing state. And if we keep doing that certainty times, then these are actually independent because we assume that we draw 
which of the two literals from the clause we draw independent of the past, the default assumption. It's all random bits. So and they all have to fail for the algorithm to not find a satisfying assignment. So here again, we use the bound on the number of steps from the worst case starting state, namely state zero. Any other state is closer to the absorbing state, so the time is only better. And we use the fact that in a Markov chain, starting at some state where you just left off in the previous trial is the same as starting a new at a random state. And the, the trick is that these uh, certainty independent runs are only a conceptual thing. Just for the analysis, the algorithm just keeps on running, which makes it uh, so nice and simple. Okay, enough for today. Next time we'll see why this algorithm performs very poorly if you apply it to 3SAT and how to still fix it to get an algorithm that's reasonably efficient for 3SAT.